Hi guys, it's Dylan from Bijou Diamond Jewelry in London with another watch video and today I'm reviewing the Patek Philippe Nautilus 5990. So as with all my reviews, let's go back in time now and take a look at the history of the 5990. Um, I'm not going to look in detail at the history of the Nautilus. If you want to learn about that, then go check out one of my 5711 reviews, which looks much more in depth at the history of the Nautilus. This one's just going to look specifically at the 5990 and its brief history. So we're going to go back in time now to 2011, which is when Patek Philippe released the Aquanaut uh, reference 5164, 5164. Uh, which was just a travel time variation of the standard 5167 Aquanaut that we had already seen. Um, it was immediately incredibly popular and incredibly useful complication for those that travelled often. The watch was a dual time zone watch and it featured the hour, kind of minutes and hour hands um, as your local time and it also had an additional hour hand on the dial that was skeletonized that was representative of your home time. So you had local time on your hours and minutes and then on the skeleton hand you had home hours. Um, so really cool, simple way of being able to tell the time, much easier than a rotating bezel. Um, I much prefer it when watchmakers put it on the dial rather than on the bezel, it makes it easier to read. One of the things that made this watch so successful straight away was the fact that it featured a very easy method of changing the hours um, on the watch or changing your, your local time on your watch. And that is just with literally two pushers on the left hand side of the watch. So after the success of the 5164, Patek Philippe decided to bring that complication to the Nautilus line um, and bring out a watch that was aimed at those that travel often for business. And that was the 5990. And that was shortly after they discontinued the 5980 in steel. Um, so that was in 2014, they released the 5990. It was available initially just in steel with a gray dial. Um, the 5990 was different to the 5164 though in the fact it also featured a flyback chronograph complication as well as the travel time function. It featured the same kind of way of interacting with the movement in terms of the pushers on the left hand side replacing the ears and, and allowing you to change your um, hour hand, uh, your local hour hand um, as we saw on the 5164. Uh, but it also obviously had its flyback chronograph pushers on the right hand side. Um, it had its uh, day and night indicators as well on the dial, um, which is, yeah, really beautiful balanced dial and was immediately incredibly popular and very collectible when it was released in 2014. And of course, sold well over its retail price in the used market. Um, in 2021, Patek decided to add to the 5990 collection by releasing a rose gold variation. Um, and in 2022, January 2022, Patek Philippe discontinued the steel 5990 um, and in then in October 2022, last year, they re-released this steel version, but with a new blue sunburst style. Um, that's kind of this grey blue, really interesting, beautiful colour. Um, even more grey than the 5711 blue that we used to have. So that concludes the history on the watch, the basic history. Let's take a look at the features of this watch now, and we're going to start with the clasp. Um, the clasp on this watch is the newer style clasp. Uh, latter models of the 5990 started shipping, you know, the previous ver version of this watch started shipping with the newer clasp, but it's quite hard to find um, those with the new clasp. This one obviously just comes with the new clasp. The new clasp is much better than the old one. It's got, doesn't anymore have that fold over section, which was a little bit of a scratch magnet because it was in brush finish as well. Um, it now is all seamless and works perfectly into the bracelet. It's a twin trigger clasp, feels incredibly solid, very, very beautifully machined. And despite its super solid, well machined feel, it still maintains a delicate Patek Philippe high end kind of um, yeah ambiance on your wrist. <laughs> um, the clasp also doesn't break up the design of the bracelet. Uh, we just have our beautiful Calatrava cross there, and it seamlessly stitches right into the rest of the bracelet. So it means we don't break up that design, which is really nice. It's also completely flat and doesn't sit or protrude out like a lot of other clasps do and that means it's not such a scratch magnet anymore. It means it just gets just as much wear and tear as the rest of the bracelet will. Moving on to the bracelet, we have a standard kind of Nautilus bracelet on this watch. Um, this is actually strangely the first time I've really responded to a Nautilus bracelet. I've not been the biggest fan of Nautilus bracelets. I'm not the biggest fan of bracelets full stop, which makes me probably an unfair judge of most bracelets as I just prefer straps. Um, but what I haven't previously liked about the Nautilus bracelets is the bubble links that join the links together. 
Um, the reason being is they protrude slightly out from the flat edge of the bracelet or the base layer of the bracelet, meaning that they are a little bit more of a scratch magnet. They, they're more susceptible to scratches and dinks. And because they're polished and curved, it emphasizes these scratches even more. And it means that very quickly after you start wearing this brand new watch, um, it starts to look a little bit worn and torn and not in such a good way. Personally, I'm not a major fan of the Nautilus bracelet, but because this case is quite a thick, big case, um, by comparison to something like a 5711, for example, it, the bracelet didn't feel like too much of a feature. It felt much more delicate, which I much preferred. But the bracelet does have some really beautiful features. It has so many different, you know, different edges, beveled edges, um, different finishes between brushed and polished and satin, etc. So it's lovely, really beautifully machined, and I really like that. Um, it's just, I'm not a major bracelet guy. Um, moving on to the case now, the case, and we'll start with the case back actually. Case, we, case back we have on this watch is obviously a clear crystal case back revealing the beautiful movement beneath or inside. Um, an incredible movement inside this watch, very beautifully finished as with every other Patek Philippe. And yeah, really a worthy exhibition case back, unlike the new Platinum Daytona. Um, yeah, really, really nice. Not much to say other than the fact that it's exquisitely finished as with other Patek movements. Um, moving on to our case, we have a mixture of finishes on this case from satin finish to brushed finish to polish finish, and everything is tied together so, so wonderfully. Um, I love on those pushes on the left-hand side um, how they've combined um, the brush finish that they have on the rest of the watch and kind of defined the edges of this of those pushes with some beveled edges. I mean, the craftsmanship just to do that alone is just so difficult, so, so hard. And they've done it absolutely flawlessly. So yeah, really beautiful to see. I love the way, I know I said that before, but I love the way that they've made part of the case that was redundant part of the case, i.e. the ears or hinge of the case on the left-hand side of Nautilus's into a functional feature that actually allows you to interact with the movement far easier than most other travel times out there. So very, very, very clever, creative way from Patek Philippe to make this watch actually incredibly useful and usable. The case on this watch is actually a little bit bigger at 40 and a half millimeters. So it is a little bit bigger than the normal Nautilus cases that we're seeing apart from the 5811. Um, and it was also quite a bit deeper than most of the watches that we see from Nautilus collection as well. The standard Nautilus or the 5711, for example, is eight millimeters in depth, and this one is 12 and a half millimeters in depth. So it's quite significantly deeper, 50% deeper than, than the Nautilus, which is quite a big chunk. And normally I don't like big chunky watches because I have quite small wrists. So a larger watch tends to look out of place on my wrist. But as you can see from the video, um, this watch looks fantastic and definitely doesn't look out of proportion. Um, I think the additional depth of this watch helps to balance out those larger um, pushes that we now have on the left have on the left hand side and the right hand side. Obviously, this has made the overall diameter or footprint of the watch much larger than something like a 5711. So yeah, the the additional depth definitely balances things out favorably, and I really like how it, how it sits on the wrist as well. Moving on to the dial of this watch, we have a beautiful kind of grey blue dial. Um, which is even more grey in tone than the 5711 dial that we used to have the blue dial for that watch. Um, and I really like this because in certain light you have a grey dial watch or a black, you know, almost black dial watch with a little bit of sunbursty kind of um, shine from the centre or gradient from the centre um, kind of pings out a little bit more, makes it very readable still. Um, but the blue comes through when you get a little shaft of sunlight on the watch or you know just catch the light on the watch you get this beautiful blue just pop straight through and that's so so special it's almost like you have two dials in one watch um, and in darker environments which tends to be maybe you know smarter occasions in restaurants or some smart events the watch does look much darker and therefore lends itself much more to maybe a suit or something more more smart and then in the day when you're out and about um, it looks a little bit more casual with the light blue or with the blue dial so yeah, really versatile, beautiful dial, incredibly legible as well. Obviously we have light colored hands, the white gold hands um, with our loom on them and also the skeletonized um, hand in white as well. And all the stuff on the dial as well, our date indicator um, and our chronograph um, counter as well down at six o'clock, as well as our home and local day and night indicators. They all sit so well on top of this dial and the indexes as well. 
um, everything pops right off this dial, which is really beautiful because it makes it very legible. So many watches these days are actually really not that legible and that can put a lot of people off. A lot of clients of ours, especially older clients, actually just don't buy a lot of watches just because it is not legible. It's easier for them to just tell the time on their phone, which is defeating the object really, um, or one of the main objects of owning a beautiful watch. I absolutely love the symmetry and balance of this dial as well. I like how we have our two subdials at the top and the bottom. Um, and we've got our nice uh, day and night indicators for home and local, um, either side of those, on the left and right hand side of the watch. So everything is really balanced, everything is very beautiful, clean, um, yeah, really well thought out. Because it is quite a complicated watch, it does have the danger of becoming cluttered, and Patek has definitely negated this and made sure that it still remains a very legible, beautiful watch. Let's move on now to how to set the watch. Um, so. First things first, it's really important with this watch that it's fully wound, um, whether you wear it first or, or you know, for a little while or actually manual, manually wind it, which is what I would recommend. Um, it's very important that you wind it first. Um, and secondly, and probably most importantly of all, before you set this watch, this watch should really be set at 7 a.m. or outside of the 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. window of time, as if you try and change the watch or set the watch during that time or between the 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. window, you risk damaging, damaging the movement. So very important that you set the watch to 7 a.m. or similar. Um, so here I've set the watch to 7 a.m. and you can see uh, we're not talking about the local time here, which is the standard minute and hours, hour hand. We're looking at the skeletonized white hand below, which is our home time, which has to be set to 7 a.m. So that's why it looks a bit confusing at first. So the manual says adjust the date first, but I prefer to, to adjust the time first. It doesn't actually make a difference in terms of um, you know, the movement or, or damage to the movement, it, that, that has no effect on the movement. It's just the reason why I always do the time first is sometimes people can set the watch wrongly. They set it to 7 p.m. or 9 p.m. or whatever instead of 7 a.m. Easy mistake. That means that you now have to cycle through the dates all again, which is just a bit tedious to have to do. So uh, I tend to set the time first and then set the date to avoid having to cycle through dates. Um, so yeah, set your time and that can be done by pulling out the crown and rotating the crown until you get to the date you want. And it's important to just regard your uh, your local, sorry, your home time, which is your skeletonized white hour hand. Just look at that. Don't just ignore the, um, uh, the local time. And then once you're happy with that, you can screw in the crown and make the, water, the watch watertight again. And you can use your pushes on the left-hand side of the watch to adjust your travel time, so your your local time, so wherever you are traveling or wherever you are at the moment, you can use the pushes, the top and bottom pushes, to advance and bring back the hour hand accordingly. So just as an example, we'll set the watch now to 9.20 a.m. home time, and we will pretend that we're going to uh, Bahrain, which is three hours ahead, at the time of filming this video, it's three hours ahead of London. So we now use our pushes on the left-hand side of the watch to set uh, three hours ahead of time on our local time at our, our hands. So you can see it's there set. Um, and then just as an extra example now, we will pretend we're in LA, which again, at the time of this filming of this video is eight hours behind um, the, the local time in London, um, for example. And so that if we bring back that hour hand, eight hours on the local time, we can now also see as we do that, that our day and night indicator for our local time changes to blue or dark for night. Um, and then our home time shows light in the window as well. So it's showing day at home. Um, really nice little subtle feature. When I said to you before about uh, maybe miss um, setting the watch and maybe doing 7 p.m. rather than 7 a.m., you should hopefully be able to see that you're setting it wrongly through your day and night indicators, which are a really nice little feature. So once you're happy that you set the time correctly, you can then adjust the date on this watch and that's being, or that's done using the pusher that comes in the box. Um, and you advance the date using the dimple on the top right hand side of the watch and you just move or cycle through the dates that way. Um, there's no kind of back and forth, you have to continually cycle through so you have to make sure you get it bang on. And once you're happy you've set everything correctly, the date and the time, you can then screw down your crown as I said before um, and then I'll just show you how to use the chronograph function. This is a flyback chronograph as well, meaning that you can instantly reset the chronograph as it's running which is a very unique feature and it seems that Patek pretty much only does flyback chronographs, which is pretty cool in their sports watches. So that concludes how to use the watch and its functionality. Let's move on to now whether or not I would own this watch. I would definitely own this watch. Honestly, 
Um, the Nautiluses haven't always been for me. I'm much more of a Royal Oak type of person. Um, but this watch for the first time, for whatever reason, I'm not sure what it is. I don't know if it's the additional depth or something, um, has made me really convert <laughs> the, to Nautiluses. I love the dial on this watch. It made me feel, it felt, felt very special wearing this piece. Um, and that's what, you know, wearing a beautiful watch is all about. And that's something I didn't quite get with Nautiluses previously. Um, I found that 5711 can sometimes feel a little bit flat and dinner platey. It feels a little bit like you're looking at a TV, that style of shape or, or case shape as well. I didn't get that at all from this watch. Um, I think because of the balance it now offers with the um, pushers on the left hand side of the watch and the right hand side of the watch, it adds a whole new dimension to this piece that the standard Nautilus just doesn't have. Um, and for me, that's why I think um, I kind of fell in love with this watch and would absolutely love to own it. In fact, if I was to look at buying a Nautilus now, this would be my go-to Nautilus and I would definitely choose it in this steel variation with the new bluey grey dial. I think also if I travelled a lot for work, this without question would be my absolute go-to timepiece from Patek Philippe in terms of Nautiluses. I think this would be a fantastic travel companion. Thanks guys for watching. That concludes my review on this watch. Let us know in the comments what you think of this 5990. Do you prefer this new dial or the old dial or the rose gold variation? Um, let us know in the comments. And as always, if you're interested in this watch or any other watch in the Patek Philippe collection, then don't hesitate to contact us. Our details are in the description. And also at the end of the video, it'd be a pleasure to call it into stock. Mm -hmm.